From the New York Times, February 12th, quote, Newt Gingrich will be out of public sight raising money for much of this week, close quote. With us today, in public sight, Newt Gingrich. Mr. Speaker, we're taping in Northern California where, as of today, a gallon of regular gas costs $3.83. President Obama has blocked the XL pipeline from Canada. He's done virtually nothing to make drilling, uh, to the contrary, he's kept drilling impossible on the northern slope of Alaska. What would President Gingrich do about energy? Well, we'd have two goals. One is to become independent of the Middle East so that we could ignore the uh, Iranians as they try to close the Straits of Hormuz and we could make sure that no future American president bows to a Saudi king. And second, we'd want to drive the price of gasoline down to uh, $2 to $2.50 a gallon, somewhere in that range. And our goal would be to open up uh, federal land and to open up offshore and to develop the maximum rate of uh, exploration and development, to also uh, change the rules so we could once again build refineries in the United States, so we could actually refine the product here, to build the uh, XL Keystone Pipeline from Canada to increase our energy capabilities. And if you look at the North Dakota experience where there's now 25 times, that's not 25 percent, that's 2,500 percent more oil than the U.S. Geological Survey thought there was, I suspect that the United States could, within a very short time, be energy independent and we could drive the price of gasoline back down to somewhere in the $2 to $2.50 range. So you, you want to cut the get price of gas by something like 40 percent over, how long will that take? I think two or three years. Uh -huh. But I think it would then be, it would then stabilize at that rate if you followed a steady policy. It would also allow you to give up cafe standards and all the Mickey Mouse stuff that's been done to cars and would allow people to buy the car they want. As I said, we're taping this in Northern California where we're surrounded by environmentalists who will listen to what you just said and picture smoke belching out of refinery smokestacks. Your answer is that's the price we have to pay to become energy independent? Well, first of all, th I don't think there's smoke belching out of smokestacks. I think we do an amazing job. Air is cleaner than it was 40 years ago. Water is cleaner than it was 40 years ago. Science and technology can solve a lot of problems. I happen to think that entrepreneurs, engineers, scientists, technicians, are better than Washington regulators and Washington red tape and Washington lawyers at solving environmental problems. And uh, free market countries have better environments than socialist countries. That's a fact. The courts. Proposition 8 <coughs> on the California ballot in November 2008 stated that, quote, only a marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in California, close quote. The proposition passed with the votes of more than 7 million citizens of California. On February 7, 2012, a three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit ruled Proposition 8 unconstitutional. Writing for the majority, Judge Stephen Reinhart, quote, Proposition 8 served no purpose and had no effect other than to lessen the status and human dignity of gays and lesbians in California, close quote. Mr. Speaker, what do you do with that decision? Well, this is one more assault on religion. It's part of the same general pattern as Obama's war on the Catholic Church. It's part of the same pattern as the court's war on the cross in uh, San Diego, the Mount Soledad cross, uh, the cross in the Mojave Desert, uh, the desire to take uh, one nation under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance, which the Ninth Circuit Court tried out. Uh, the fact is that uh, you have anti-religious bigots on the court. Uh, I don't think we need to tolerate them. If people go to newt.org, they'll see a 54-page paper outlining the balance of judicial power and indicating that we, the people, have a right through the Congress and through the President to intervene to uh, restrict the court's ability to have these kind of judgments. I mean, the sheer arrogance of two or three lawyers thinking they can overrule seven or eight million people just tells you how out of sync our courts are and how out of sync our legal class is with uh, all of the ideas the Founding Fathers had. The Founding Fathers had as their number two complaint after no taxation without representation, uh, was British judges who they regarded as dictatorial. As President Gingrich, you would appoint conservative or constitutional jurists, but beyond appointing judges, what else would you do? Are there well, other remedies? I, there, are, there are a number of remedies. I would, uh, for example, the case of Judge Bayer of uh, San Antonio, who on June 1st ruled that not only could students not uh, 
pray at their graduation. They could not use the word benediction or the word invocation. They couldn't uh, use the word God. They couldn't ask people to rise. They couldn't ask for a moment of silence. Uh, and then he said he would put the superintendent in jail if they did any of those things. I think he should be impeached. I think that it is outrageous to have an anti-religious bigot uh, serving as a federal judge. And when he exercises his personal judgment, uh, there, you know, there are no grounds for saying you can't use the word God. None. Okay, draw a distinction for me here. Legal scholar and Hoover Fellow, colleague of mine right here at the Hoover Institution, Richard Epstein, quote, Speaker, this is in response to uh, a statement you made uh, two or three weeks ago. Speaker Gingrich should remember that the one great concern that the framers had about the judiciary was the institutional arrangements that were needed to serve its independence. We should tremble at the prospect of congressional inquisition of judges. I think that's a fundamental misreading of the Constitution. The Constitution provided for a balance of power. Uh, the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton writes, the judicial branch will never tackle the executive and legislative branches because it's the weakest of the three branches. Jefferson abolished, uh, and we have to assume since Madison was his Secretary of State, that Jefferson had some knowledge of the Constitution. Uh, Jefferson abolishes 18 out of 35 federal judges, just wipes them out, so go home. No more, no more salary, no more court, goodbye. Uh, Jefferson, when asked about judicial supremacy, writes back, uh, that is an absurdity, it would be an oligarchy. Uh, Lincoln says of the idea that nine people can make law, that would eliminate freedom for the rest of us. And he repudiates the idea that the Dred Scott decision by the Supreme Court is the law of the land. He says, no, it's the law of the case. Mm -hmm. But the, the court does not have the power to create the law of the land. Uh, part of his first inaugural is dedicated to telling the Supreme Court where to get off. So we've gotten into this cycle starting in 1958 with the Warren Court. The, the lawyer class loves the idea that they are the center of the universe. Uh, the law schools love the idea that they get to define the Constitution. It's simply untrue. The budget. <clears throat> Earlier this week, President Obama released his budget for 2013. Uh, the Wall Street Journal noted that after four years of spending more than 24% 24, 24 of GDP every year, and that's the highest spending rate since 1946, as we were coming out of the Second World War. After four years of 24% of GDP every year, President Obama now predicts that under this new budget, we will spend 24.3% of GDP. What does President Gingrich do to get us back to the historical norm of 18 to 20% of GDP? Well, first you pass a uh, law replacing the 130-year-old civil service system with a brand new modern management system, which uh, experts uh, estimate would save us $500 billion a year. Second, you bring in the American Express Visa and MasterCard model of anti-fraud effort, which experts believe would save you between 60 and $110 billion a year on Medicaid and Medicare fraud, not counting food stamp fraud, st student loan fraud, and other kinds of fraud. Uh, third, you abolish a number of departments, starting with the Department of Energy. I'm for actually having energy rather than having a bureaucracy of energy. And we've, had, we've tried this experiment of whether or not bureaucrats in Washington create energy. They don't. They set up things like Solyndra. They increase corruption. They increase scandalous behavior. They waste money. Uh, they actually slow down the development of new technology. So I think we'd be better off to, to look, go through selectively eliminating some departments and some other activities. Uh, I think we also should uh, fundamentally overhaul uh, the way the federal government runs uh, the Pentagon. And we should rethink from the ground up foreign aid. I mean, foreign aid has for a half century sickened countries, increased the power of bureaucracies, increased the level of government corruption. Uh, we ought to fundamentally re-examine what are we trying to accomplish and is government really the best way to accomplish it? So there are a number of steps we could take. Uh, I helped author the only four balanced budgets in your lifetime. We paid off $405 billion in federal debt. But there were two keys to it. One is to get unemployment back down to 4%. It was at 4.2% when I left office. Uh, the other is uh, to dramatically expand American energy. Remember, every time you produce more oil and gas offshore or more oil and gas off, the f off of federal land, you are increasing revenue to the federal government. Mm -hmm. So you can have a substantial increase in revenue without a tax increase. Now, so one of the fundamental impulses of what you're saying here is there is in Washington a calcified, enormous structure, establishment. The federal government is part bureaucracy, part the lobbying and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, bureaucratic, the political establishment, and you intend to take to that a sledgehammer, right? Well, or the votes of the American people, which may feel like okay, a sledgehammer. Now, okay, so now you, get, now you get to what, I now address you not as a candidate, but as a historian. 
Milton Friedman noted, James Buchanan, Nobel Prize winning economist with his public work uh, theory, noted this fundamental problem in our institutional arrangements. You could also, you could call it a small c constitutional problem. Whereas federal costs are dispersed across all of us, the benefits of federal spending accrue to small groups which therefore have permanent incentives to organize and manipulate the, the political system to increase spending further and further and further. So we see this taking off with the New Deal. It, get, it becomes more uh, entrenched as a result of the Great Society. That's an institutional, small c, so to speak, constitutional problem. What do you do with it? To can you fix that permanently? You have, can have a, come into office in a huge wave of popular support for doing something as Ronald Reagan did in 1980. And even well, at that, domestic spending only slowed. Well, there, there are only two times we actually cut domestic discretionary spending. 1981 under Reagan, I voted for it, and 1995 under me as Speaker. So we have done it twice uh, since World War II. But look, first of all, you have to offer a better future. So I want to attach a training component to unemployment compensation so no one ever gets, and ever again gets money for doing nothing. They have to sign up for a business training program, increase their human capital if they're going to get unemployment compensation. Uh, I want to offer people paychecks rather than food stamps. And, and let's have a fight. I mean, somebody who says absolutely flatly they want to be dependent, they're not part of our majority. But I don't think there are very many people who, given a choice between a paycheck and food stamps, are going to pick food stamps. And so I think we have to go through and really offer a dramatic future. When you say paycheck, better. you mean a uh, job? Milton Friedman's. Oh, I see. Okay, I thought you were talking about a negative income no, tax. No, no, no. I'm talking about, talking about an old-fashioned idea. They actually go to work. <laughs> they actually, they actually. You need to earn. slap me. I'm yeah. not with you yet. Yeah. Okay. okay, all right. They need to earn the paycheck. Got it. Got it. Healthcare. You've said you want to repeal and replace Obamacare. Both strike me as pretty tall orders. Repeal it how? Well, you repeal it by making it a major condition of the fall campaign. And you challenge every member of the House and Senate to pledge that they will stay in session on January 3rd, 2013, and they will repeal it before I'm sworn in as president on January 20th. And I think by October, they're going to find it very dangerous to go running around saying, no, I won't. And so your first goal is to win the election. See, I, I'm actually an old-fashioned American. I believe you run an election on real ideas. You actually win the vote of the American people by winning the argument. Then you have elected people who promise to do something which the American people expect them to actually keep their word on. And that's the model we used in the contract in 1994. It's the model Ronald Reagan used in 1980. And it turns out to have an enormous amount of power tied to it. Repeal it and replace it. Replace it with what? I think replace it with a much more decentralized system that gets uh, back to you and your doctor and your hospital so that health once again becomes a local personal matter rather than a Washington bureaucratic matter. Okay. So this brings us again to this notion of changing the entire political landscape. You said uh, you were questioned about Medicare in an interview in December and you replied, quote, you govern over the long term by having the American people think you're doing a good job, close quote. Entitlement after entitlement, Social Security, Medicare, all the entitlements, the polls show over and over and over again, people want smaller government, yes, but they want the entitlements. How do you do well, that? Well, let's, let's take two examples. All right. Um, and Social Security, I want to offer younger people the right to choose a personal Social Security savings account. Uh, we have absolute historic proof that in Chile for 30 years, people have been allowed to have a, sa a personal Social Security savings account they're getting two or three times as much money as they would have gotten under the traditional system. Uh, you also reduce the inequality of wealth in a country by about 50% over a generation because everybody becomes an investor and a saver from day one. Mm. And so you suddenly have, uh, today when you pay your Social Security tax, it goes to the government. In a personal Social Security savings account, it becomes your estate. If something happens to you, the money belongs to your family. So it's a fundamental shift. It also means no politician ever again tells you when to retire. It's your money. You're working. You retire when you feel like it. You don't have to have some politician dictate your life. Now, there, there you have a model which leads to a better system with greater returns coming off a fundamentally different principle, the principle of compound interest over time, rather than transferring money in the old order. And, and there's an example where you can actually win the argument for a better system that is an earned entitlement rather than a given entitlement. And I think, it, I think that that's a change. 
Uh, secondly, uh, I, yeah, sure. It sounds good. During the 1970s, almost an entire decade, the stock market just went sideways. 1987, wasn't it? The stock market dropped by almost a third in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. So what you said sounds good in theory, but there are moments you can point to in American history when if you had wanted to retire in 1977, say, that would have been a wrong, a bad moment for you under the Gingrich plan. Is that right? Well, except if you decided to retire in 1977, you probably began working in 1927, and you now had the compound interest built up for your entire lifetime since 1927. So while it wasn't as good as it would have been in 1970, it was still huge. In, in the Chilean system, and also in, in uh, Galveston, Texas, they... The city of Galveston the has city a of Gal like The city of Galveston is the only place in the United States that was allowed to opt out. Congress made it illegal after they opted out. So their public employees are actually in a, in a personal savings account model. Uh, Chile actually guarantees that everybody will get at least the minimum Social Security check. So if you fell below, you'd still get at least the minimum. In 30 years, they've never written a single check because it turns out you normally have two or three times as much. Mm -hmm. So to drop from two or three times as much to below one is an enormous decline, and it's never occurred. And who handles the investments? They actually contract out to a series of uh, companies. So uh, it's not the government it's choosing, not the government. choosing in fact, stocks. In fact, there's a, there's a firm in <coughs> uh, Des Moines, Iowa that is one of the major managers of the Chilean system. Really? All right. I, but I'm sorry, I, that was a parenthesis. You said there was a second example. Well, the second example yeah. is, is uh, Medicare, where what I want to do is give people more choices uh, so that they can use their own money if they want to. They can contract with their own doctor. They don't get trapped into Medicare red tape and Medicare regulations. And our goal should be, as conservatives, that we want a market in which you as a consumer have a greater range of choices, you know price and quality information, and you can make an informed decision. And I believe that millions of individual consumers will do a better job driving down price than a handful of bureaucrats issuing rules in Washington. All right. Foreign policy. Let me give you a quotation from yourself. Quote, Newt Gingrich, quote, we face a radical Islamist threat that is much deeper and much more pervasive than anyone in our culture wants to talk about." Close quote. Well, I think that's true. I think it's objectively true. Uh, it's true uh, whether you're in uh, Iraq or you're in Iran or, or Afghanistan or Pakistan or uh, the Philippines or Thailand or Malaya. Um, just look at places where bombs go off. Look, look at the, the range of organized efforts there are to uh, kill people. and. Uh, recognize it, that some of it is international conspiracy like al-Qaeda, some of it is state-sponsored terrorism like Iran, uh, some of it is a strange mixture like Hezbollah and Hamas. Uh, but but we, we have not come to grips with how dangerous radical Islamists are and how widespread they are. Nor have we come to grips, this is why we need an American energy policy, so that we are independent of the Middle East and we are not sending money to our enemies. Uh, we, have, we have not been, we've been afraid to come to grips with the degree to which the Saudis, for example, are the largest funders of schools called madrasas that teach hatred. And, and we don't want to collide head on with the Saudis because we need their oil too much and therefore we pull our punches. But the fact is we should have energy independence and we should say to the Saudis that we consider it an extraordinarily unfriendly act to be financing these kinds of hate institutions that are very anti-Western and very anti-Christian and anti-Jewish. So President Gingrich gets rough, tough on the Saudis. What else does he do? What are the other implications of seeing the well, Islamic well, threat Well, there, there, there are implications, first of all, that we need to design a grand strategy, that we don't have one. Uh, there are implications that we want to actively, through covert means, uh, seek to replace the current Iranian dictatorship. Uh, there are indications that we want to rebuild our intelligence capabilities. Today, the, the intelligence community is so crippled by the Congress uh, that we really don't do very much spying. We mostly rely on people, uh, the Egyptians, the Jordanians, uh, the Iranians, the, I mean, not the Iranians, the Iraqis, the Pakistanis, to give us intelligence information. This is a very bad model. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as Stalin failed to live up to the agreements at Yalta to hold free elections in Eastern Europe, as it becomes clear that he's an occupying force in Eastern Europe, George Kennan, a staffer in the Moscow uh, embassy, writes the, what's the, the famous long telegram and within two years, he does this within two years of the end of the Second World War and outlines what becomes the policy of containment that remains in place for the next four and a half decades, essentially. Has the long telegram been written yet? No. Well, one, of the, one of the greatest problems we have right now is that the Obama administration won't even use the words radical Islamist. 
I mean, it is, it is impossible to think coherently about Obama's foreign policy. Uh, many, many years ago, George Orwell, the author of uh, 1984, wrote an essay on politics in the English language. Mm. And he said, you can tell when somebody has really bad ideas because they can't explain them. Uh, the bad language and, and bad ideas f go together. And I would say that the very fact that the Obama administration has tried to outlaw any honest description of radical Islamism uh, tells you how far from reality they are and how dangerous their foreign policy is. Iran, last month the New York Times ran a very heavily reported article uh, in the magazine, the Sunday magazine, quote, will, uh, titled, Will Israel Attack Iran? And this article quoted one highly placed Israeli official after another, including the defense minister, Ehud Barak, former prime minister of Israel, as saying that we are now down to a few months, not a few years, but a few months before Iran will develop a nuclear capability. Does that sound right to you? Are we doing what we need to? Are we, well, I'll get to Israel in a moment, are we doing what we need to? Well, I can't tell you if it sounds right because I don't have the kind of intelligence okay. information that the uh, Israeli defense minister has. And of course, he was both prime minister and he was chief of staff of the Israeli defense force. Once so he's, he's, he is very knowledgeable. Um, what I would say is that the policy of the United States should be to replace the Ahmadinejad dictatorship. Uh, we, should, we should follow the policies of uh, President Reagan, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, and uh, Pope John Paul II, who successfully unraveled the entire Soviet empire without a general war. And we should be bringing every possible covert means to bear to arouse and organize and help dissidents across Iran uh, until they, in fact, uh, break the back of the dictatorship. We should be bringing pressure to bear economically. We should use force as a last, not a first resort. But, but you're we'll, willing to use it. Absolutely, and I'm absolutely willing to, to respect the right of the Israelis. If you're an Israeli prime minister, and you remember that in the World War II, people did not listen to Hitler, and as a result, seven million Jews were killed. And you realize that three nuclear weapons placed properly is a second Holocaust and will kill another six or seven million Jews. I think you have to, as a matter of your obligation to your country, be prepared to stop the Iranians from getting nuclear weapons. And if that means you stop them by uh, putting, um, using your own force to break up their system, then you have to do it. And I, I, I don't think any American can second guess the Israelis in their own self-defense. Uh, we can run much bigger risk. We're a continent-wide country. They are a very small country, very heavily concentrated. They're within missile range of Iran. And I don't think that they can take any risk with their survival. China. Uh, the vice president of China, whose name I can't pronounce, Xi Jinping, maybe, and the likely president of China next year is visiting the United States. Uh, for more than a decade, China has experienced double-digit growth rates, lifted some half billion people out of poverty, and I think you would agree has expanded at least the economic sphere of freedom. We have that on the one hand. On the other hand, as uh, prominent Asian scholar William Kirby at Harvard has observed, if Mao were returned to, to return today, he would recognize all the instruments of power. The party remains in place. The various bodies in the party remain in place. The communist ideology remains unchanged. What do we do with China? Is this a, friend, well, I, look, a friendly I, look, adversary? Me, first first of all, I don't, I don't agree with the last thing you said. You're not going to buy that? Well, okay. it, it, yes, it's an authoritarian. You're to rewrite the question. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's an authoritarian dictatorship. Uh, and it's certainly a place you, you and I wouldn't want to live in right. terms of being under Chinese control. And it certainly is a Chinese nationalist attitude towards the world. So they'd like to be, once again, the Middle Kingdom. Uh, not but, Marx is true but, 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 it, but it's, there's, there's, Mao would be appalled <laughs> at the degree to which they now have capitalism, they have corruption, uh, they have differentiations in wealth. I mean, you know, remember the last phase of Mao is wearing uniforms and everybody looking like they have pajamas on and uh, trying to desperately to get to conformity. I mean, it was really a pretty bizarre place. We've gone from bicycles to Rolls Royces. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, and, and we've gone to a pretty high level of, of freedom of knowledge, if not freedom of action in politics. Uh, but I think we have to, we have to do a couple of things. First of all, we have to get our own act together. We have to rebuild our manufacturing base. We have to rebuild our educational system. We have to be uh, capable of balancing our budget. We have to pay down the, the bonds that the Chinese currently own. And when, when I realize that the Chinese have probably a trillion dollars in U.S. bonds, I find that very disturbing. And I don't think, we don't want in the United States 
which is indebted to China. Uh, we, went, we went to the United States, which is the leading country in the world, and there's, there's no circumstance in the next 50 or 75 years where I'd want my children and grandchildren to be in a world dominated by China. Uh, I think we're much safer to be in a world where the United States is still the leading country, where freedom matters uh, and where the rule of law really matters. You mentioned fixing the educational system as one component of getting our own act in order. What does a president do? What can a president do to fix the educational system? Send it back home. I mean, the, 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 the effort, and I would say this is true of Sacramento as it is of Washington, the effort to create bureaucracies of learning who then issue instructions so the little bureaucrats of learning can lead each classroom is a disaster. Teaching is an inherently missionary behavior. You have to have somebody who's passionate. They have to care about the children. They have to care about learning. Uh, they have to rise, raise them somehow above the norm. And every time we try to bureaucratize it, we kill the very spirit of learning and we kill the very spirit of teaching and the end result is a net loss. Religion. You mentioned a moment ago that the Obama administration had declared war on religion in America, particularly on the Catholic Church. I'm just going to give you a moment to take back the word war. Well, I th I, listen, it's, you want to? Uh, no. I think that it's very clear that this is an administration which believes that secular government, that the president, they believe the president is superior to the pope in the ability to define what the church is allowed to do. By the way, this was also Governor Romney's position. Governor Romney, as governor of Massachusetts, overrode his own public health department and denied Catholic hospitals a conscience waiver on whether or not to give out abortion pills and said, no, no, you must give them out. This was a decision of the governor's office while he was governor. Mm -hmm. Now, he was not as militant as Obama. Obama Obama's position, which is, which is truly dishonest, you know, th this new compromise is, is, is literally, I mentioned Orwell's 1984. This is Orwellian. Uh, what he's now saying is, all right, I'm not going to require your hospital to buy insurance you don't believe in, but I will require the insurance companies to only issue insurance you don't believe in. Uh, and they think we're stupid enough to not be able to tell that it's the same, it's the same process by a different mechanism. We have been through a 50-year period, starting in the 1960s, in which the courts and the bureaucracies and now the politicians have waged war on religious freedom in America. And I think we need to understand this is just one more phase in an ongoing assault on Christianity and on Judaism and on organized religion by secularists who believe that they have the right to get between man and God. The campaign. Lots of arguments against Newt Gingrich, but in my judgment what they come down to is two. Here's one. You may be running against the establishment in Wall you've, you, you use the, you've used the phrase the establishment in both parties. But you've spent the last three decades in war. You're not an outsider. You're an insider's insider. How do you handle that argument? It's easy to look at all of my policy positions, all of which are for changing Washington, and then look at who's opposed to me, which is the entire establishment. Uh, you know, if I was the establishment candidate, I, you wouldn't have all these lobbyists on K Street giving Mitt Romney money. Uh, the fact is, like Reagan, I came to Washington as an outsider. I governed as speaker as an outsider. We forced real things to happen. You, you look at the current mess in Congress, and then go back and look at reforming welfare. Two out of three people went to work or went to school. Cutting taxes for the first time in 16 years, largest capital gains tax cut in history. Insisting on an increase in, in money for intelligence, the 9-11 Commission said the only increase in the 90s was what they called the Gingrich Plus Up. Passing four consecutive balanced budgets, uh, first time, the only time in your lifetime. These things all required actual leadership, which is a very un-Washington behavior. Uh, there's an old rule that Sam Rayburn once said that you go along to get along. Right. I didn't. I led. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. on Franklin Roosevelt. Second-rate mind, but first-rate temperament. And this is the second argument against you. What it comes down, nobody questions your intelligence, your knowledge, mastery of the details of policy, your political creativity, but what we've learned in the last month or six weeks is that from George Will to Charles Krauthammer to the editors of National Review to Ann Coulter, lots of people are suggesting that you're temperamentally ill-suited to the top office, undisciplined, unfocused, mercurial. How do you handle that? Well, first of all, you just described the Washington Insider's latest attack on me. I mean, 
Yes, the establishment doesn't want me to be president. Why don't they want me to be president? Because I actually force change. Uh, I ran for five years, lost twice, and won a congressional seat. I was the only Georgia Republican congressman. I spent 16 years helping develop a majority in the House, first majority in 40 years. I led the effort to get reelected, first reelection since 1928 as a majority. Uh, after 30 years of campaigning, starting with Ronald Reagan in 1966, we actually passed welfare reform, largest entitlement reform of your lifetime. I spent 23 years teaching in the senior military. Uh, I'm the longest serving teacher in the senior military for admirals and generals. I mean, these are examples of calm, steady persistence. Now, do I have a strong personality? Of course. You think you're going to change Washington with some kind of mild-mannered, timid manager? You can manage the decay. You need a leader to break out of the decay. You led in the polls, then you didn't. You led in the polls, now you don't. Are you still trying to get to 1,144 delegates to clinch yes. the nominee? You are. Yes. You're not just trying it. At this point, with time running out, you're not saying, okay, let's well, just we, get to the convention and, and settle it there. We've only picked 10 percent of the delegates. Okay. I mean, uh, the, the, we have a real opportunity. Uh, both on Super Tuesday and again in Texas uh, to, to suddenly open up. And we're out here in California, the largest delegation, uh, in hopes that we could win the primary out here, which would, and it may well run all the way to June as the uh, Clinton, remember the Clinton and Obama fought all the way to June. So it wouldn't be a shock to see California actually matter this year. Last question. Financial system is still recovering from the crisis of 2008. We're suffering slow growth high unemployment. We borrow 40 cents of every dollar the federal government spends. The Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, just announced uh, cuts in the, that may mean we can't afford any new aircraft carriers for the foreseeable future. On and on and on. What happened to Britain after the Second World War is what's happening to us. Irreversible, historic decline, and nobody, including Newt Gingrich, can stop it any more than Winston Churchill was able to prop up the British Empire. Mr. Speaker, your response? Well, you just described why Calista and I decided we had to run. I mean, we were faced with looking at our two grandchildren, Maggie, who's 12, Robert, who's 10, and saying to them, you know, once upon a time, we were the greatest country in the world, and our generation failed, and you're going to inherit a mess. Or you could roll up your sleeves, decide to run for office, and say, you know, we can turn this around. I'm an American. I, I served with Ronald Reagan. I remember when he replaced Jimmy Carter. We went from malaise to miraculous recovery. I think there's every reason to believe that we can go from Obama's left-wing extremism to a liberated America where we unleash the American people. And once again, we prove to the world that free people can achieve almost anything. Newt Gingrich, 58th Speaker of the United States House of Representatives and candidate for the presidency, thank you very much. Great to be here. My pleasure. Thank you.